China is undoubtedly a large country, but there are concerns it wants to get bigger, particularly in the Western Pacific. Australia and New Zealand are worried about reports of a new military base in Vanuatu. There are islands that China says belong to it and claims that China is building airstrips and stationing forces there. What is going on? You're watching Roundtable with me, David Foster. In the course of the last 10 years, China has made multi-million dollar loans to a number of Pacific Island nations. The UK has just announced three new diplomatic posts in the region. Coincidence or does the West have reason to be concerned? China's influence is reaching well beyond its borders. From expansive highways and marine routes connecting Asia to Europe, to military bases in the contested South China Sea and Djibouti in Northern Africa. But the West is nervous about its influence in the Pacific. Is the global superpower preparing to militarize the region? China is reported to have held talks with Vanuatu over a potential military base on its shores. Despite both countries denying it, Australia and New Zealand are worried. We uh, would view with great concern the establishment of any foreign military bases in those Pacific Island countries and neighbours of ours. I'm very openly expressing now and would do so to any others, um, privately and publicly, uh, that we take a strong position in the Pacific against uh, militarisation. To bolster support, Britain has announced plans to open three new diplomatic posts in the region, including Samoa, Tonga and most crucially, Vanuatu. China has a history of vast military expansion. Its naval ships in the South China Sea patrol islands it claims as its own in a territorial dispute with neighboring countries. The United States also patrols the area in what it says is a mediatory role. America's far-reaching military presence from South Korea to Australia's Northern Territory has proven to be a good defense system in the past. It used Vanuatu to launch attacks against Japan during World War II. So is the Pacific an opportunity for China to boost its military reach? China has strong diplomatic relations in the Pacific. It contributes to development projects in Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea and Tonga. Already China has built a wharf on Vanuatu's largest island and delivers much needed medical supplies. Is there a payoff for this ongoing investment? Vanuatu already supports China's claim over disputed islands in the South China Sea. So what are China's true intentions in the Pacific? How is it affecting long-standing relationships in the region? And is the West right to be concerned? Okay, let's start talking. Joining us via Skype from Berlin, we have Malcolm Jorgensen, international law analyst at Humboldt University in Berlin. He served in the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, advising on China's Pacific militarization. From New Jersey, we welcome Jan Bennett, manager of the Center on Contemporary China at Princeton University, who worked in China at the U.S consulate for a number of years and we have Ujay here at the round table head of China foresight at the London School of Economics the LSE ideas and Kerry Brown director of the Lao China Institute at King's College London uh, this is going to be fascinating because I know you, all, you you differ in your views in certain ways so I'm going to go to Yan first of all the, the question is why is China doing this because I is undoubtedly <coughs> Uh, pushing the boundaries in the Western Pacific and the South China Sea. Uh, why does it feel it needs to do this? Um, I think this is part of China's goal to be able to um, uh, to extend its capability into far seas protection. Um, right now, China's capability is only in near seas, which means the coastal regions of China. Um, by going by building its military uh, to be able to assert itself into the Pacific um, Island area 
it would be able to uh, become a, a regional power in, in um, Asia. And, and why would it want to do that when it, it is, you know, it's gone outside the first island chain, the near seas for the first time it's starting to move out? What particular reason would it want to build itself militarily in those areas? Um, China has some uh, several interests in doing so. Uh, it wants to protect uh, the, the, the sea um, communication lines. Um, for the South China Sea and the East China Sea, at least, it wants to um, also be able to go into these areas in case there are uh, uh, unmined uh, resources there. Um, so it's, it's asserting itself into these areas so that it can um, uh, protect its interests. OK, we'll, get, we'll go to Berlin, and then we'll bring the discussion back, back to the table. Uh, Malcolm, you are from the Australia-New Zealand uh, region. We saw the New Zealand Prime Minister there looking extremely exercised, rather worried about it all. Why in particular do you think those two countries uh, need to be concerned? Well, for the longest period through most of the 20th century, Australia and New Zealand security has essentially been underwritten by US hegemony in the Asia-Pacific. That is, that's the assumption that uh, the security relationships will ultimately be underpinned by U.S. power. The idea that South Pacific might become a region where China is controlling some of the security relations was almost unthinkable previously, but it's almost the natural consequence of rising Chinese power. And so mm -hmm. this has been a slow increase in Chinese power. This possibility, which is certainly not confirmed, that there might be a military base being thought about in Vanuatu, really changed the whole idea that the near seas of Australia and New Zealand are areas um, that are friendly inherently to that country. Uh, and so that's the reason why there is this concern, yeah, yep. um, even though it's a remote but, 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 but why worry about China? Clearly it wants to expand its influence, but uh, not necessarily aggressively. Well, you have to understand that Australia in particular um, has always been allied with the strongest maritime power in the Asia Pacific. So the United Kingdom initially, then the United States. Increasingly, that country is China. If that's the case, as a country who is not so closely culturally aligned with the country, certainly, and so that obviously is going to create some um, apprehension in the country, but actually the intentions of China, its global strategic objectives might well differ. Its internal system differs from Australia and New Zealand. And so it a fair question to ask how this changes. I mean, countries don't like these major ships necessarily, and so it's a fair question um, to think about what are the implications. Okay, let's kick some of those ideas around at, at this table. Um, Kerry, let me come to you first of all. You don't believe that the military idea in Vanuatu is a real concern, am I right? Well, the so far speculation, I mean, no one's confirmed anything. Um, and they both countries deny it, China and Vanuatu. Yeah, and I guess they would. I mean, so so... I'm not saying that there might be something, but there's no hard evidence. I, I guess I'm more interested in the response, this very, very kind of panicky, kind of worried response. In a sense, it's almost like there's a psychological war going on, and China's winning it at the moment. I mean, it's, it doesn't have to do a great deal to spook people. And if you look at you know, the kind of fact that it's the second biggest economy in the world, it is central to most of the trading in the region, it isn't illogical that it would want to protect its interests. As, as Jan said, it's got sort of uh, interest in resources, it's got trade links, it's got this huge area that it's got a strategic uh, interest over. And so, in a sense, it's strange this hasn't happened before. And also, it's, a sense, it's also quite strange that it's so um, spectral and illusory. At the moment, we're looking at shadows. We're not looking at real things happening. China, we have to remember, has not fought a combat outside its uh, territory since 1979. It has not won a war since 1962. It has not fought in a major war since 1950. Uh, the UK has more experience in combat last weekend in Syria than China has had in the last 40 years. Okay, but it's got a massive army. I mean, you know, we don't, there's no doubt about that. And if it wanted to militarily <coughs> expand, geographically expand, it could do so, even if it were not the best trained army in the world. L let me ask you, a, a, do you see anything different in China's policy of the last three to four years with these islands in the South China Sea, mm. with what is happening in the, in the Western Pacific, to what we've seen uh, 
prior to that? Mm -hmm. I think the issue in here is the perception. It's the perception of that sense of uh, somehow the danger, the tension China has brought onto the negotiation table on the South China Sea that make the neighbor countries, uh, make Southeast Asian neighbors, but also Australia and New Zealand fear the most. I think it's really, as what uh, Professor Brown said, it's a psychological game is going on among those Pacific islands and Pacific countries. That's one thing. And the second element which I want to stress in here is that hard lesson China has learned by, back by 2011 in the Libya crisis. Um, the Chinese army or the navy force has to, had to rescue over th three, 35,000 Chinese employees working in Libya and plus another 2,000 other citizens from the other of the world. So China realized it need to have somehow a space or place where they can speed up this rescue process. So I think it's really from a diaspora point of view, it's a sense of civilian point of view, and China need to have that sense of... Well, why on earth do you need a military yeah. base in Vanuatu mm. to rec re mm. perhaps rescue your citizens who mm. might be working in parts of Africa? No, I mean, uh, it's just it, it's something might happen. Like, for example, in the Pacific Island, in Solomon uh, Island, back to 2011, 2006, and then that's, uh, there's a large number of Chinese business community over there and has been suffering the most. Mm. See, I'm just wondering, isn't it a bit yeah. naive mm -hmm. to assume this is simply to protect its people who might be working abroad? And I'll put this one mm -hmm. to, to you, Malcolm, if, mm -hmm. I, if I may, first of all. It's a bit naive to think this is about protecting its people mm -hmm. who might be working abroad when, in fact, it's developing this massive trade route, the One Belt, One Road, uh, that is designed to connect parts of Africa, Asia, um, and Eastern Europe with China to expand its economic position. And it has a massive number of economic positions to defend, or at least it will do. To think this is simply about protecting a pocket of people here and there is a bit naive, perhaps. Yes, I'd entirely agree with that. I mean, in the sense, China's behaving exactly the way that we'd expect a rising great power to behave. It's creating these maritime routes and these trade routes to extend its economic power. And so the One Belt, One Road initiative is first and foremost about economics. But it's inevitable that it's also going to create connectivity, that's its intention, both through infrastructure and relationships, that will also facilitate the possible use of military power and also a spread of its ideas and its um, soft power as well. And so it would be perfectly rational and it, what we would expect for China to then be able to use that maritime route for military purposes in the future. And so it's just uh, the log logical explanation, and it is, as you say, um, unlikely that it would not be um, thinking about the possibility of that in the future. I mean, do, do feel free, each one of you, to jump in, or if you disagree with any of the points raised by, by one or other of you. But, yeah, let me put this one to you, and we'll see, see where we go. You mentioned unearthed resources, um, valuable materials elsewhere. Just give us an idea of what you're talking about. Uh, we're talking about, um, so uh, China's in search of energy. Uh, it has vast energy needs. So it's looking for natural gas, it's looking for hydroelectric power, um, and um, it's also looking for uh, raw materials that uh, it uses in manufacturing. And where would it find these outside its own borders? Um, well, under the seabed. Essentially, that's why um, that's a large part why it's in the South China Sea. Um, also, in the Pacific Island area, there's, you know, uh, uh, suspected untapped resources there as well. International waters. Uh, that's correct. Well, these are waters claimed by other countries through their uh, economic uh, exclusive economic zones, the EEZs. So, um, in, in the South China Sea, these are contested waters. Uh, Okay, so, so, so what we have here are, are a different number of powerful countries all looking to boost their own economic position and all saying we have a right to do so. Is that a fair summary? China yeah, just mean, being one of them. So this is like a massive chessboard. I mean, the Pacific is like a massive chessboard and the two big players are America and China. And mm -hmm. Xi Jinping said when he went to America in 2013, that the Pacific is large enough for both of us. So that's the proposition. Is it large, large enough for the US and China? Uh, the great military sort of assets that China have, sure, it's got a lot of frigates, it's got a lot of ships, it's got more in terms of numbers than America, but their technological capacity isn't anywhere close enough to America's. I think it's like a shadow game. I mean, basically, this is, you know, sort of the real conflict I think that China is fighting is probably more in the virtual world. There it has penetrated deeply. This is a sort of bit of a distraction. 
seriously, Vanatu? I mean, do you think that that's going to help China at all in its strategic interests? If it wanted to stake out kind of territory, it would go a bit closer to home. I mean, this is very marginal area. Yes, it is a long way it's down. It's, 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 it's massive. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's almost like a kind of psychological prod, and it's got this spooked kind of response it mm. wants. Maybe it's not too smart because now everyone's looking at it too hard. But if you take a look at it, you say um, the, chi the Chinese naval force, I think you said, mm. well, the, the, mm. the, the, is bigger mm. than yeah. the US in, the, in that area. But let's take a look at this. Um, the US Pacific Fleet. Patrols the Western Pacific, 200 ships, nearly 1,200 aircraft, 130,000 personnel. Another map here, Darwin, Northern Australia, 2,500 troops proposed, drawn globally. This is U.S. influence. U.S. and Australia and Perth discussing a plan to U.S. Navy greater access there. Guam, an extra 4,500 troops. America mm. is being aggressive in this area. Mm. You know, not firing guns necessarily, mm. but it is repositioning people. Mm. Now, is that why China's worried? Or is the US worried because China's doing what it's doing? No, I mean, China has every single reason to worry, like many other countries have every single reason to worry about China's action within South China Sea, within Pacific. I think it's really the sheer size. And because of China is so different, like, you know, it's so different from many other regimes within the region. And that's perhaps put China in a completely different box compared with many, you know, so-called global liberal international alliances over here. You see, what I, Malcolm, let, mm. let's, let's kick this around between all of us. Mm. Um, what I'm suggesting is that China's worried because America's expanding. Uh, we're talking about whether the U.S. is worried because China's expanding. I mean, they're all in the same category, aren't they? They are in a sense, but historically... They've been, they're placed in different positions at this point in time. So broadly, their interests are the same. But the United States, has been discussed, has been the hegemon in the region. China has a perception of itself that over a longer period, over millennia, it is the rightful regional power. And so it's challenging that position through building these maritime routes, but also then militarizing slowly those areas as well. And so, uh, yes, there is this contest where each side is uncertain about what the other is going to do. Uh, but... China, in a sense, is following the trends of history, that um, the weight of history is on its side in terms of economics and its growing influence in the region. And so it's, uh, in one sense, now um, expressing that through these quite concrete projects, uh, for mm. instance, investing in Pacific Island nations in very strategically important places. Um, and so that's essentially a continuation yep. of where it sees itself going Kerry forward. Kerry wants to jump in on yeah, something you I, said. I'm a bit sceptical about this sort of thousand-year-long you know, myth of Chinese kind of hegemony and, you know, there were many different Chinese histories over that time. Mm -hmm. And at the moment you have a very specific leadership under Xi Jinping that does have a very strong nationalistic narrative. And the Pacific is like a kind of theatre where that is being played out. But seriously, if you had that amount of American influence right on your backyard, you know, like China does, you would be nervous. You'd feel in China in the past has filled contained. I mean, the bottom line is that those Asian lines are still policed by American ships and they're not an ally of America, of China. So it isn't irrational that China is trying to create more space. It's just a question of what is the appropriate response by America and its allies. One of the problems with Australia at the moment is its ally, America, is led by someone who is not that predictable. So that has created a lot of space and opportunity for doubt, and that's something we just have to live with at the moment. Luigi? Well, it's not just, uh, it's just, I mean, I uh, mostly agree with uh, what Kerry said. It's, it's not only about space, but it's also to do with the domestic economy, to do with what really China wants to drive its own domestic economy, obviously rely on trade, rely on international transportation. And by having, whatever, a bigger navy, is the part of the way to protect China's interests within the region. So I, I, I don't see why China cannot, you know, protect its own interest while at the same time and play tango with the others. Mm. What are the dangers, mm. do you think? Um, Malcolm in Berlin, what, what, what needs to be avoided at this point? Well, well first of all, I just agree with um, Professor Brown that, yes, China's behaving very rationally in this situation. Um, and that it's not as though there's some neutral set of rules on the ground and China's now the one that is disrupting all of that. They're trying to rebalance in one sense. But what looks more fair to them is inevitably going to be seen as threatening to countries who are used to the status quo um, that exists. Now, to get to your question, the problem, of course, is that as China tries to rebalance power in the region in this way, there's always room for miscalculations, the fact that there is this human element. If you said there's an unpredictable leader in the White House, um, and so that's the potential worst-case scenario, that 
this could all um, unfold um, in a, a relatively straightforward way where it's a more difficult strategic environment for Australia, but there's no conflict. But there's also the possibility that that could happen if there are miscalculations. And so it's really that worst case scenario that needs to be avoided while realising that for, from Australia's perspective, for instance, the best case scenario is probably at an end. That is to have a regional hegemon who is um, so closely aligned with Australia. I mean, just, just help me with this one. I, I don't think either Australia or New Zealand thinks the Chinese Navy is going to land in Darwin and try and take over the country, does it? Absolutely not. But I mean, the concerns are more subtle than that. So Australia, much of its trade, um, the bulk of it relies on going through the South China Sea, this contested area. Now, um, at the moment, there is no push from China, for instance, to prevent that. But if increasingly, as has been the case, China has requested, for instance, permission or at least notification to go through some areas formerly thought as international waters, that obviously is concerning for a country like Australia if that is seen as a trajectory towards something more concerning. Again, all of this can be managed. There is not an inevitability of conflict, but it is perfectly legitimate for a country to, to look at the trends and see that it is becoming a more difficult environment, and so sometimes more forceful responses might be okay, required. If not difficult, then certainly different. Is this a case of worrying about nothing? You know, well, worrying I, for I, the sake of worrying, I mean, because it's just a sleeping giant waking so, up and stretching, so, um, stretching his limbs. Yeah, and I mean, I'll come to you in just a yeah. second, if I may. I, I was based in Australia for three and a half years, and I, I mean, is this not a great opportunity for Australia to stop being such a parasite on, on, on Washington and America and start thinking about its own security concerns? I mean, it's like outsourced the most important thing a sovereign nation should do for most of its modern history, as you say, either the UK or America. Now is the time for, you know, kind of Australia to start articulating a much more unilateral security concept. And that doesn't mean that the Prime Minister Turnbull can bellyache about America coming into, you know, China coming into its backyard. That's going to happen, and Australia needs to think of a more robust and rational response to that. I'm going to go to, to Jan in, in, in Princeton, and just, because we've only got about five more minutes left, and, and add an extra dimension to this. How much do China and the United States need each other at the moment, given the prospect of those talks about the Korean Peninsula? Uh, they need each other very much. Um, uh, so North Korea had reached out to the United States um, to, to talk about denuclearization of the peninsula. Um, and I, based on interactions between North Korea and China, it seems that China wants to reassert itself into that conversation. Um, and uh, uh, because um, the United States needs China to cooperate uh, with North Korea, in order to denuclearize the, the peninsula, so they need each other very much. So uh, what we're seeing at the moment is it's not even a phony war, it's, it's not even a, a war of words, it's just the war in the media. Well, it's something to do with this much ado about nothing, because I know in the past year in Australia, they run this a very strong <laughs> ideological contention, so-called against the Chinese influence. So they have to Australia. stay friends, um, the United um, States and see, China at the moment, for obvious reasons. Well, it's a sense of utility. I think if we're using Machiavellian so ideas, you know, how, you know, how useful each country can be towards each other. I think there's a got perfect reason in here to make sure two sides, Beijing and Washington, get on with each other. Do not play with the fire. Because okay. the end will be yeah. mutually destructive. Yeah, or, or, or nothing at all will happen. Malcolm, are you going to sleep easier tonight, given what you've heard? Mind you, you're an expert in all of this anyway. <laughs> I, I, I'm not, not sleeping at this point. Okay. I, mean, I completely agree that there are great opportunities here for Australia, again, given that it's in the region with the um, what's going to be the largest economy, or by some measures already is in the world, that it has a strong relationship with China. It's simply a note of caution that this is a more difficult environment, and it is with a country that has very different, a very different world view from that which has been Australia's closest ally to this point. And so... For that reason, because of the uncertainties, there is no clear way forward, and that's why there's such an intense debate within Australia, even, about what precisely it should be doing in relation to these countries. Fascinating. We're seeing tectonic shifts, aren't we, aren't we here? But at the same time, we're also seeing everything happening underneath the water, and it's all pretty calm on the surface. Mm. Well, I, I mean, to come back to the issue of Australia... Um, we don't have very long. OK, just saying mm. sort of very, very quickly, you, you know, uh, this is the opportunity when Australia gets screaming and calling and dragged into actually being an Asian nation. It is an Asian nation. It cannot pretend it's a European nation. It cannot pretend it's an American nation. It is an Asian nation. And I think this is a sort of, you know, kind of 
it, in a sense, this is indicative of how tough that is for Australians to think of themselves as Asians, mm -hmm. you know? And China, as an Asian country relating to them, there are lots of commonalities. There's profound political differences, and you're right, there's lots of issues, but the bottom line is that this is the moment when we all have to recognise, and Australians recognise, they're Asians. But this is uh, indicative of a changing, changing China, and, we, and we've got to... We've got to wrap it up in just a minute. Right, I mean, is that sense of paranoia about China, you know, what China is for? What is that really strange creature which does not fit into any kind of democratic political system as such at all? So therefore, China must be bad, and that's in their dichotomy. Okay, well, listen, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, and I, I saw you nodding at uh, what Yuji had just said, but I can't come back to you for, for another comment. We thank you, both of you, Berlin and Princeton, for your contribution to this debate. I find it fascinating. You know, you come in here with preconceptions, which everybody's going to say what China's doing is bad. Actually, in a sense, what we're talking about here is China's doing what comes naturally. It is sort of expanding, and it is an expanding economy. It's an expanding population. Um, I think it's something worth keeping an eye on, and we will do that again. It's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, and thank you for joining us on Round Table. Sometimes it isn't all doom and gloom, but it's worth keeping an eye open for. This has been Roundtable. I'm David Foster. Hope to have your company next time. Bye-bye.